длинный. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us at the center at the Belvedere. Um, we are live on Facebook and here with Dr. Will Kurtz. Um, Carolyn Merrick was with us. I think I'd like to invite her to just say a few words real quick. Okay. Hi, I'm Carolyn Merrick. I'm a program coordinator here at the center. Thank you, as, as Tom said, for coming. and. I just want to thank Tom and Dr. Kurtz for this wonderful partnership. Um, this is really important information, really important to tell these stories, and we're excited to um, be able to provide the space for that. And again, we thank you for coming. I hope, too, you go visit downstairs. We have the Francis Brand exhibit hanging up, and maybe Tom can talk to you more about what that is. We're also having an artist reception yes. um, on uh, Thursday, July 21st from 4 to 6 p.m. So be sure to check that out. And again, thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, I apologize to everybody on Facebook land. My uh, partner's right-hand man, Sterling, had to leave on a family emergency. He would be here to help me out. Um, but. If, if everyone just think good thoughts for him and his family, um, and I'm more than happy to jump in and juggle this because he's got other things to take care of. But I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, for those on Facebook, if you want to leave any questions in the Facebook comments, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, we'll have a little Q&A for those here with us at the end of this so you can ask those questions. Um, a few announcements. Um, like Carolyn was saying, we're very thankful for this partnership here at the Center of Belvedere. Have a lot going on over the next few months. Through August 31st, as she said, the Francis Brand first portraits are downstairs. There's a selection of 25 of those. Uh, we, uh, she was an eccentric local artist, folk artist, um, who uh, did a number of firsts. The first of people to do th certain things, um, the first mayor, the black mayor, first white woman who was a mayor, and all kinds of others that uh, she put in that exhibit. So please come back on July 31st, we'll have a reception for that. Um, and then on every Monday at 2 p.m. until August 1st, we'll be holding Sevilpedia cultivation events. So if you don't know what Sevilpedia is, come on Monday at 2 o'clock and you'll learn all about it. And uh, you can be your own historian and add information for our local history through Sevilpedia. So we encourage you to um, uh, be a part of that. So I was going to hand it off to Sterling. I hand it off to myself. Hello. <laughs> I'm Tom Chapman of the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome you to our unregulated historical meanderings, the Black Virginians in Blue edition. Uh, this is our 14th unregulated live show in which we invite some persons or person to join us and have a casual conversation about things of interest uh, for our history buff friends. Uh, today we're proud to welcome Dr. Kurtz. Uh, Dr. Kurtz was a former managing director and digital historian at the John L. the III Center for Civil War History at UVA. He's published two books and many articles and book reviews related to the American Civil War. Uh, a past employee of Virginia Humanities. He is a veteran of a number of digital history projects, including Black Virginians in Blue, UVA Unionists, Founders Online, and People of the Founding Era. Um, today we're going to talk to Dr. Kurtz about his article, Black Virginians in Blue, The Untold Stories of Albemarle County's U.S. Color Troops, um, that we had published in our 2020 magazine. Um, but before we get to that, he also won an award for that article, and we wanted to 
do a little presentation real quick. Uh, we have the Jane Tarleton Smith Moore Essay Award, um, awarded in honor of a longtime Charlottesville resident, uh, Jane Moore. And the Publications Committee, who include Phyllis Leffler, Kay Slaughter, and Irvin Jordan, selected Kurt's essay for the award, writing in their selection that the article is extremely thorough and will be a model for other communities seeking to understand the role of African Americans during the Civil War. We appreciated his ability to put the story of the troops in a larger context, exploring antebellum Albemarle and the numbers of slaves, persons of color, and whites. In addition to lots of demographic data, numbers of black soldiers who enlisted, numbers in Albemarle, numbers who deserted, the mortality, fatality rates, he also discusses the broader context of the war, looking, for example, at the Emancipation Proclamation and its impact and what happened after the war's end. He distinguished between soldiers and sailors, explaining the differing conditions. The research and findings break new ground and are generally not well known. Um, and that comes from Irvin Jordan, too, who was a member of the Publications Committee. So this essay is a model of excellent historical analysis. So with that, Mr. Kurtz, I would like to present with you a small certificate and Thank a, a so little much. token of our appreciation. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Tom. This is a real honor. So with that, we will now talk about this excellent essay and this groundbreaking research. So. How did the Black Virginians in Blue project get started? Okay, well, uh, Black Virginians in Blue was uh, one of the digital projects that we wanted to do at the center. Uh, the now Center for Civil War History was founded back in October 2015. Um, I started sort of working for the center before I was actually working at the center uh, for a number of months because they needed somebody who could uh, edit a website. Um, but uh, we, in early 2016, we kind of said, um, well, what, what are the kinds of things that we could do that would be useful contributions to uh, Civil War scholarship and to our local community? Because uh, we wanted to have, uh, we had a, lo a lot of scholarly content and things planned, but not a lot um, other than talks geared towards you know, local history. And so uh, Dr. Elizabeth Barron, who's still with the center, said, well, why don't we do uh, a history project about all the African-American soldiers from Albemarle County in Charlottesville. Uh, nobody's really done that before. And so she went online, and uh, there was a wonderful database of, of black men who enlisted in the state of Missouri. And suddenly, all these men from Albemarle started showing up in this database. And we're like, well, that's interesting. What's going on there? Um, and I talked to Irvin Jordan, who I call the godfather of this project because he was the first one to try to make up a, a list, and he went to Ancestry.com, and they have a partial database of all black soldiers there that you can search by birthplace. And so he had a list of about um, 60 or so men, and I was basically told, figure this out. Um, so <laughs> not a, I was kind of given those two things and told to go from there. And but you weren't on your own. You had student no. help, right? Uh, well, initially, I was sort of on my own. Yeah. yeah. Initially, I was on my own, and uh, we can talk about the students more in just a second. Um, but um, uh, I kind of went through things, and it was amazing all the things I could find online. This is back 2016, 17. And I just combed through them and realized that Albemarle County is a really difficult county to spell. I was in Charlottesville for like a clerk who's never been there, some northern clerk, enlisting this uh, black man from, the, from uh, Virginia. And uh, so, you know, I realized quickly that I had to go through every single Virginia enlistment to see if I could find phonetic spellings of Alabama County, uh, <laughs> Charlottesville, or Charlottesville, Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. And so, I mean, and then, and then, of course, the R and the L. I mean, it's, it's just like, you know, uh, it was all over the place because the clerk had no idea where this place was. And so I, I combed through records online. I went to the National Archives, and I looked through um, 50, 70 different um, 
original records of just lists of the thousands of men that were in each regiment and looked page by page looking for them and uh, I mean that's that's how it sort of got started uh, you know and I just took it from there and I said there's no way I can you know it's one thing to find them but it's there's no way I can actually do all the research and so that's when we started bringing students from UVA on board to help us out with uh, with uh, flushing out those stories putting um, a, giving a story a life story to the, those names that I had found so how did those students get involved I mean that was through internships or through exactly so uh, for about the last four years of the project I was never I always had at least one student working with me on the project uh, in the summer and then I had two uh, students uh, usually for the whole uh, academic year some of them stayed on for a couple of academic years and they were working with me to um, uh, look through do kind of what the work without I was doing but some there were some other databases online that I really needed their help with and uh, basically I trained them in how to do genealogy while learning how to do it myself I said okay we have these databases let's start with the military records and let's build out these lives as far as we can and so they went in and they looked through newspapers, several different newspaper archives, trying to find obituaries, marriage notices, um, mostly post-war things because there wasn't a lot. Um, most of our men were enslaved, so there wasn't really a lot of news about them in the newspapers uh, at all uh, before the war. Um, looking for marriage certificates, uh, you know, after the war from those databases. Looking for um, any kind of, uh, you know any kind of uh, record we could find in uh, newspapers, ancestries, various databases, and then occasionally in uh, a database called Full 3, which was the source of our information about what they did during the Civil War. Um, occasionally, some of them actually re-enlisted in the Army or Navy after the war, so there was a little bit additional information there as well. But uh, it, uh, then, then what happened was we realized that uh, a lot of these men filed for pensions, and so we had, I think, I think between me and a, another researcher, a couple other researchers, we took 10,000 images of pension records mm -hmm. at the National Archives, something like that. Or, I mean, we ended up with at least 10,000 images of primary sources all together, and so I had the students go through and summarize the pensions for me, like pulling out the most important details, tracking down every one of their children if they were mentioned, um, tracking down their uh, before the war story, their after the war story, anything that they said about during the war, uh, these pension records were uh, massive and absolutely essential for telling the stories of these men, um, and these uh, soldiers and sailors, uh, and trying to flesh out their lives and tell that whole story. Because I didn't want to just have it be a military project, I wanted it to be a social cultural project that, you know, said, you know, the, these men were, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're interested in them because they're Civil War soldiers, but what about their lives uh, can we find? And so um, that kind of became the process of, you know, uh, determining what was possible and what wasn't uh, in terms of the amount of research funds and time we had in trying to flesh out those stories. I'm curious, were you able to connect to any modern descendants of these people? Yes, so at Liberation Freedom Day, I should thank the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, who was absolutely very kind to us and gave us a lot of help, um, connected to us with a number of wonderful local historians. Um, at one of the Liberation Freedom Day events uh, that I, I did, we actually had uh, some of the descendants of the Taylor family. James T.S. Taylor, uh, may, some people may have heard of Fairfax Taylor, who's more famous uh, father who were uh, free uh, African Americans living in Albemarle and Charlottesville actually uh, before the Civil War and so that was a, that was really wonderful and then I was able to connect with um, some of the uh, Taylor family who moved outside of uh, was no longer in the city um, were able to join us for that event um, and then some a lot of people in Pennsylvania found out about what we were doing and started contacting me so even uh, I met some descendants of some of our, our men who moved to Pennsylvania uh, and their families lived in Pennsylvania, so that was, that was really rewarding for me. Wow. And sharing, like I, you know, with his relatives in t town, I just said, here's everything. I handed her everything, this, this big stack of stuff, you know, here you go, like this is everything I've found so far, and let me know if 
you have any questions. <laughs> um, did you get any questions? I didn't get any questions because I also gave them the, the biography we had worked on too, okay, so, so to kind of distill the mass a little bit, of yeah. papers, yeah. Well, with a data set like that, and particularly with pension records in terms of being able to connect generations, I mean, I think, I mean, it makes sense that you'd be able to then link a little bit closer to the modern day and find those community, those families, so that's pretty cool. Right, well, I mean, we were only able, when we were building out the database, we were only able to s basically put in um, the soldier and his wife in most cases, and their their children, we didn't go much further than that with our research, just because of time and re resources. We wanted to kind of give you a sense of what their nuclear nuclear family was like, um, what the family life of the soldier was. Uh, but um, yeah, we could have, you know, we, we, it could never end uh, with all the stuff that we wanted to find out that we didn't find out for some of these men. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot more there's a lot more to be done, which is really exciting. There's probably more men that we haven't found yet, and there's probably um, more res resources out there. For example, if uh, uh, most of our men have left the state by the time they enlisted in the 1860s, and so there's got to be wonderful records at local uh, courthouses all across Missouri and. Uh, Louisiana and, and places like this, um, some records, uh, maybe some local records up in uh, um, Ohio, and I, you know, I just didn't have the time to go to those courthouses, right? So there's there's a lot more of the story to flesh out. Um, but the pension records were essential for us in terms of like uh, most bang for our buck, if you will, because it just had such a wealth of biographical family data uh, that it was um, that was what, and it was all in Washington. So who's in one place as opposed to so many places? Mm -hmm. um, that was really uh, what allowed us to tell some of those stories really well and really thoroughly. So back to what you said there in terms of um, you know, very few people who were um, in blue, the Virginians in blue, were actually living in Virginia or even in Albemarle when right. they joined. Why was that? Uh, so, I mean, so it, there were, the, Albemarle County was majority black in the, in 1860. There were more uh, en enslaved people here than there were white people, uh, according to the census. And then there were another 600 free African Americans, uh, according to the census, living in Albemarle County. So, so the, for like a context, that was like 14,000 yeah. slaves versus 13,000 Yeah, white, about that, about 13, 12, something like that. Um, so, uh, a lot of them, um, you know, and and remember that Albemarle County doesn't see uh, a Union Army in force until early March of 1865. So, and it's well be behind uh, Confederate lines. You know, the Confederate Army and the Union Army is uh, as cl the closest they get for most of the war is like the environs of Richmond or Washington. Mm -hmm. So, and they were only here for a few days. So there's not, you, you know, there's no Union Enlistment Center in Albemarle where these men could enlist uh, deep within the Confederacy. So um, although a few men did escape and did get to <coughs> Union lines during the war and did enlist, uh, like James T.S. Taylor, for example, was, was, was one of those men living here in Albemarle, most of them had left. And why is, that, why is that? Well, it wasn't their choice at all. It was a result of the slave system in place in Virginia in the antebellum era, either uh, our, men, our men enlisted in more than 20 different states, more than 20 different states, only 14 of the 255 enlisted in the state of Virginia, all right? So how do you explain that? Well, if you're a free African American, there are laws that make it really difficult for you to live here in Virginia. So you move to the free, many of you will free, move to the free north, places like um, Chillicote, did I butcher that? Sorry, Chillicote, Ohio. Um, is a very popular place for Albemarle African Americans uh, who've been freed or were are born free. A lot of them emigrated there. Uh, in fact, one of the most recent ones, we a uh, gentleman we found after this article was published, a man named Joseph Carr was, he, that's where he lived. Uh, if you were enslaved, uh, you were, Virginia exported almost 300,000 slaves uh, in the three decades before the Civil War. So you're sent individually by the slave trade out to Louisiana to work in the awful sugar plantations or Kentucky or Missouri, um, all those places. Um, and then, you know, also a lot of 
uh, white um, slaveholding families basically ran out of room in Virginia. So where did they go? Did they go to places like Kentucky? And especially, because that filled up pretty quick, especially in the first, the last couple decades before the Civil War, you moved to Missouri. You moved to the middle of Missouri to uh, basically a uh, transplanted colony of Virginians, a, a lot of Virginians who moved there en masse with their slaves. And so we actually had a lot of men who uh, I mentioned earlier enlisted in the state of Missouri because a man named John Coles Carter, who is descended from the famous uh, King Carter of uh, a huge landholder back in the uh, colonial era, um, he and his family moved all 100 of their slaves out to uh, a couple counties in Missouri. And so um, of those slaves, uh, more than 20 of them actually enlisted in the Union Army, a staggering number from just that one, those his two plantations. Uh, I should mention that the Carters also had connections with the Jeffersons uh, as well. But um, so you've got, you know, just whole plantations picking up and moving. You've got individual sale and you've got uh, free people trying to make a better life for themselves in, uh, in, in the North. And so those places, either because they're free at the beginning of the war or because the Union Army occupies them, so they occupy most of Louisiana, right? Then you get those, you have the opportunity for black men to enlist <coughs> when black men are finally welcomed into the Civil War in 1863 uh, to fight for their freedom. So yeah, so with, uh, you know, we're talking about large numbers and dispersals, but with your research and understanding and learning more about these individuals, do you have a sense of why they joined? Why they joined the Union Army? Sure. So a lot of men did not leave a record of stating exactly why they, w why, you know. So we have to speculate. We have to look at other sources for, um, for context of African Americans who did put on record why they enlisted. And so um, if our men were like them, there's several reasons. They thought that, um, they thought first and foremost that fighting in the Union Army would end slavery. Uh, they believed that the Emancipation Proclamation, which also the final one in January 1st, 1863, which also paved the way for African Americans to enlist in mass uh, across the occupied South and the North, they thought that would bring freedom and that the only way to ensure that the Emancipation Proclamation took effect was to join and liberate, uh, liberate these areas where people are enslaved, where maybe their family members are still enslaved. Uh, a lot of men joined, and in joining, they became free themselves, and in some cases, their families became free. So you have an automatic freedom conferred upon you and sometimes your family by enlisting. Some men just needed jobs, too, to survive. So there's, there's an economic factor here where a refugee who's left um, their home in Mississippi, in, or excuse me, let's say Kentucky, and has gone to Ohio, um, you know, not only can they fight to end slavery, but they also, you know, can support their family, not having a job, being a refugee without uh, any means of support um, in the North. And then, you know, a, a number of them as well thought that the, um, you know, preserving the Union uh, was the right thing to do, too, that uh, preserving the Union uh, would be the only way uh, to uh, force the final end of, end of slavery. The Union of course, if the Union fails, then basically the pro-Confederate sla uh, slaveholding South breaks away, and uh, so who knows when slavery will be done, right? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, and I should say that um, James Taylor, who kind of got close to explaining this, um, he also saw it as a fight for equal rights. So he felt that in fighting for the North, they would African Americans would prove that they should have the right uh, to vote after the war, that they should be treated uh, more as equals after the war. Um, during the war, he was a very outspoken proponent of uh, black men becoming officers. If you know anything about the Civil War, most black regiments, which, which were segregated, sorry, I should have started with that earlier, but most regiments are, black regiments are segregated. Black men are serving in segregated regiments with white officers and there's only about 100 black men who become officers over the course of the entire Civil War. Most of them um, from Louisiana very early at the, at the beginning of black enlistment in 62 and uh, 63. 
and then at the very end as sort of a reward for their good services in the more liberal northern states like Massachusetts, um, uh, Connecticut, places like that. So uh, for him, it was, you know, we're going to end slavery and we're going to claim equality as well. And there are a lot of other, uh, Frederick Douglass echo this as well. This is a very important thing for uh, Frederick Douglass to, to, to show that they were equal, they were equal to white men and therefore they deserved the rights of citizens. Yeah, well, that, nice segue there. Thank you for that. Because I was looking at the, the Douglas quote in the article. Um, and so from the article, it's, though slavery was the proximate cause of Southern secession in the ensuing military conflict, black military service in the Civil War was not a foregone conclusion and was indeed a highly contentious issue in the Union states. Black men across the North tried to enlist, and leaders such as Frederick Douglass pleaded their case. As Douglass later said, let the black man get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder, and there is no power on earth which can, de which can deny he has earned the right of citizenship in the United States. So it makes a very strong case that these individuals serving in an army, serving in a, the Union, trying to preserve the Union, were also trying to think of a better life for themselves, I would think. Yes. Yes, them and th them and their families as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so I guess what comes to mind is maybe the movie Glory. Sure. Yeah, the idea of the, was it 54th Massachusetts yes. that were storming Fort Wagner? So, yes. Uh, but that was a common thing in terms of how these units were, um, they were segregated still. They, it wasn't an integrated military that really didn't come about until the Korean War. Yes. Um, so it was a, another 100 years later before we would actually you know, black and white could fight together against a common cause. They had to fight in separate units, but they were, um, uh, the officers were all white. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, we, um, we have a, we had another project that we worked on at the same time uh, called um, UVA Unionists, which was about UVA students who um, fought for the Union instead of the Confederacy. Most of them fought for the Confederacy, but uh, there were a few a few dozen that did the other way and some of them were uh, involved in raising some of the regiments that are or one of them a man named uh, Bernard Farrar was involved in raising a regiment that some of our men enlisted in which was kind of a interesting connection but uh, otherwise no, no no big UVA connection for anybody who's hoping for one that, I, that I've seen so yeah I think I remember there was one individual a, Davenport, who was in the 54th from all yes. tomorrow. Okay, yeah, yeah, I should I should mention this. So James Davenport joined the 54th after Glory, um, well, after or after Fort, Fort Wagner, Wagner, I should yeah. say. So, and he was a cook, so he wouldn't have been um, in a combat role. But the 54th and 55th, the 55th Massachusetts was um, a, reg a regiment that had a lot of men from Albemarle County in it. Um, in fact, there was also another regiment of. Um, of cavalry, of black cavalry from Massachusetts that had a couple of men uh, in it as well from Albemarle County. But the 55th was, the 54th was so popular that it filled up too fast to take on everyone who wanted to join. So they created the 55th Massachusetts to take all of the African American men who wanted to enlist as soon as possible um, because Massachusetts was ahead of the game compared to a lot of the other states. Um, and the 55th and 54th fought a number of battles after Fort Wagner. Fort Wagner's not the end of the war for um, those, uh, those soldiers in the movie Glory. They fight in places um, like the Siege of Charleston or the Battle of uh, Honey Hill, which is in South Carolina, further south towards Savannah. Um, they, are, uh, they, they have a very distinguished career, too. It's just they don't have a movie, so. <laughs> um, but they, they, also, they also fought in they don't have Matthew Broderick and Denzel Washington. And, no, you know, they don't. They don't. Uh, it's, uh, well, but but to the reality of it, you know, um, many of these boys in blue, you know, gave their lives. The, you know, gave it all for their their country, or their new country, or their their what they wanted that country to be. So, you know, what uh, I was surprised in terms of the fatality rates and the mortality rates of, I mean, how many of the 255 that served made it through the war yeah, unscathed? That's, that's the other thing. So, I mean, there are a number of takeaways from this project. 
I mean, the first thing that hits you right away is, wow, none of them are actually uh, anywhere near Albemarle when they join. And so got to explain that, which we talked about earlier. And the other thing is, is uh, so many of these men die before the end of the Civil War. Uh, in fact, um, 72 of them died, um, including uh, 72 total of the 255 mentioned in the article of the 257, the two men we found after the article was published. About 28% of them, uh, of the soldiers, not include, we're not talking about the sailors, none of them died as far as we've been able to determine, but 28% of the soldiers who enlisted, uh, who were from Albemarle County, where Charlottesville was not independent at that point, so let's just go with Albemarle, um, died, and it, that's a staggering number. Now, almost 18%, uh, or about 18% of all African-American soldiers who served in the Civil War died, and that's, that's staggering. I mean, can you imagine if the casualties had been like that in Afghanistan or Iraq, you know, any of our modern conflicts, it's just, it dwarfs anything, um, including Vietnam. And then another, you know, 10%, 28% of our men. So how do you explain that? And how, how do you, um, you sort of, for me, it became honoring that sacrifice. It was a tremendous sacrifice they made on behalf of um, the nation and uh, ending slavery. And so what happened was, was because so many of these men had been moved out to Missouri, they ended up serving in these awful conditions. Um, so I, the, the figure somewhere in the article is about like 70, 70 or so men um, enlisted in the state of Missouri who were from Albemarle County. Um, you know, and like, and half of them, half of them die um, in just two regiments, the 65th and the 67th, which were um, noted for being two of the absolute worst regiments to be in, in terms of casualties across the entire Union Army. Um, we had 40 men from Albemarle County, black men, serving, and, uh, excuse me, 41, and 21 of them died, okay, so just, just over 50%. And, and how do you explain this? In fact, um, the 65th is infamous because it had um, more men die, uh, it is, it had, the highest casualty figure of any Union Army regiment that did not have someone die as a result of a battle. So they never see battle, but they still had this gigantic um, loss. And how do you explain it? Well, what happened was, was that after the white regiments had been formed in Missouri, the places where they were enlisted and trained fell into disrepair and became um, very disease-ridden. And this is where they sent African-American troops. So a lot of them actually died before they even left for the front. And then, what, and then you ask, okay, so what happens next? And they get sent to Louisiana because the belief at the time, the racist belief at the time, is that African Americans are better suited for heavy labor in the tropics than white men. So we're gonna send black men there because they can handle that weather uh, disease better than white men can. And to be honest, a lot of those men had been on farms, so they weren't exposed to any of these diseases that they encountered down there. So they died um, in large <coughs> numbers from things like um, smallpox and pneumonia and dysentery and diarrhea. Those were the three top killers uh, as far as disease goes across the Union Army, specifically for black troops. And so they're in these awful places in Louisiana. One historian referred to it as the graveyard of African-American soldiers. Just so many of these men uh, die leaving their families without fathers or um, wondering what happened to them. In some cases, they, they, they lose complete uh, touch with them. Only of the 72 men who died, only five overall died from combat wounds. One died of an accident, but the other 66 died from disease. And so um, disease killed a lot of white soldiers too, but it killed so many more black soldiers and so many more of our soldiers uh, that, I mean, you're not just enlisting, um, you know, you're not, it's not something you just do without, uh, without, you know, any, uh, with, with, you know, okay, I'm, I'll, I probably won't see the front, it's no big deal. I mean, this is a very serious thing that you're doing, um, as you can see from these figures, and the fact that they, uh, they suffered so much played into the reason why there are so many pension files um, on their behalf, because, um, you know, if your your husband dies in the Civil War, you have a pretty, if you're a widow, you have a pretty good claim to a pension. You have a 
airtight claim to a pension. And unfortunately, there were a lot of widows as a result of their service, the nature of their service. And then of the men who didn't die, many of them were left with debilitating disease and disability for the rest of their lives. And so just reading these pension records can be heartbreaking because you can see how it you know, just ravages the family or it just ravages the soldier over time. Like there's certain, of the soldiers who survive, you can just see them slowly, you know, slipping away. And sometimes, you know, maybe it's not the Civil War, it's just old age, you know. But a lot of times it's, it's you know, that lingering gunshot wound. It's that blindness and I can't support my family because I was out doing guard duty in the hot sands of Texas and, you know, lost my, went partially blind or, you know, I, a horse kicked me and so I can't, you know, do a full day's labor, that sort of thing. Um, and then you see uh, the doctors going back and forth, um, belittling their experiences in some cases, trying to find ways not to give them pensions. And it's really, um, it's really, you know, just heartbreaking to see them, all, all the suffering as well. So the, all the hero, uh, heroic um, things they did, but also, I mean, it, this, uh, there was just an, an they really paid for their sacrifice. They really paid for, um, for this country. They really, you know, really made tremendous sacrifices. So the decision they made to serve, even if it's not Matthew Broderick and Denzel Washington storming Fort Wagner and the glory of that. Right. But what you're getting at is more like the reality and the, the, the tragedy of warfare is that in many cases, putting all these people together and putting them into the situations and environments that they are, you're, you're impacting their health in other ways. They, they chose to serve the country, and by doing so, they put themselves in harm's way, which is maybe not in front of a bullet, but, you know, digging a trench, you know, around, you know, a, a fort or something and getting malaria, so. Right, and um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but. We're good. Okay, if, uh, just a digression there. Speaking of, of digging trenches, um, yes, a lot of these men didn't see combat, so a lot of their suffering was just from accidents, or post-war suffering was from accidents, and a lot of their, um, from diseases as well, and the, the death too. But uh, a lot of them did fight in the most famous battles that black soldiers were involved in, um, especially 1864 and 1865, when they started to be used in combat in large numbers. Um, at the Battle of Nashville, Tennessee, that resounding victory that uh, destroyed uh, Confederate General Hood's army once and for all at the uh, end of December 1864, at the long sieges of places like Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and then of course during the uh, Petersburg campaign, that long, you know, months long, almost year, two thirds of a year long siege that finally ended in Appomattox, there were several regiments and a number, half a dozen or so African-American men from Albemarle who took part in that final surrender of um, Robert E. Lee in, uh, on April 9, 1865, bringing to a close, or starting to bring to a close the Civil War. But um, one of the men whose story I, I can't, um, you sort of jostled in my memory, is this man named Peter Churchwell, who's just briefly mentioned in this um, article, but he actually has a really full testimony explaining everything that happened in the Civil War, and not all the men do this, because a lot of times when you're going for a pension, you're just explaining the disease or the, the disability that you have and how it related to the Civil War, but this man went into all this detail, so there, there's an additional reason um, why it's dangerous to enlist as a black man, because if you're a former slave and you're captured, you're going to be re you're going to be shot, or you're going to be re-enslaved by uh, your white owner if they can get a hold of you. And this is exactly um, what happened to uh, Peter Churchwell, who not 30 days after enlisting in the Union Army was thrown into the Battle of the Crater, that horrific battle that um, took place in, I believe it was in July of 1864. And if you know anything about the battle, um, black troops were right? in yeah. Petersburg, yeah. They, black troops were supposed to lead, had been specially trained to lead the assault and move around with this crater that was going to be formed by a giant explosive, but instead um, what happened was these inexperienced white troops were put in at the last minute, plunged into the crater, everybody followed them in, and then the Confederates rallied and started just massacring everybody in the middle of this crater. Churchwell is one of these guys, and he gets shot in the head, but he survives, um, and a lot of the black troops who surrendered were s summarily executed. Um, he wasn't, 
he was made to dig um, trenches for the bodies of all the people who had died. Then he was shipped out to Western Virginia, sent back to Richmond after a notice had been put in the paper um, saying, hey, this is one of these escaped slaves, come and claim him. So his former master finds him, claims him again, and sells him down to North Carolina where he gets sold a couple more times um, before he finally escapes to freedom when the Union Army passes through North Carolina in um, the spring of 1865. But, um, you know, so he, he was like the worst fear of a black man, you know, being put in the harm's way by these vengeful uh, former owners who might just kill him, or um, if he was lucky, you know, spare his life only to be re-enslaved. So, um, I mean, it was really, that's part of the reason why there was so little desertion for black troops, is because if you're, you know, hundreds of miles from home, you're not gonna desert because you, you're not like a white soldier who can be captured and sent to prison, you're gonna be re-enslaved, or you're gonna be put to hard labor. Um, they're not going to treat you like a POW. So one of the reasons why African Americans didn't desert um, is because, I mean, it was, it was suicide. Uh, and also, you know, I think it also speaks to the strength of, the well, first reason is they really believed in what they were doing and they wanted to end slavery and deserting is not, uh, you know, not going to help that. But the second reason is, is that, you know, um, there's no mercy if you get caught by the Confederates kind of explain, it explains why they didn't desert as in as high in numbers that Union, white Union troops did. Wow. Just wow. <laughs> that, that's a story with Churchwell. Uh, yeah, and it's all in the pension record. So, I mean, it is taken down, not in his, not, he, he didn't write it down, but in his own words, taken down, one of the more rich testimonies I've ever seen. Um, and uh, it's just, it's just incredible. One thing that popped to mind was the pensions. Um, in many cases, if the soldier had passed on, then the wife would apply for a pension. But with African Americans and um, the inability to lawfully marry, was that a hindrance in terms of how the government looked at providing pensions? Exactly, yes. So um, for a white soldier, white soldiers had the pension um, process much easier than black soldiers because white soldiers, I mean, they were free. And so they could conduct le legally um, binding uh, with paperwork marriages. Um, they would have maybe a birth, a baptismal certificate for their children so they could show, um, the widow could show uh, that as well, saying like, I need extra support because I have four kids who are minors still. Um, so they have all this paperwork, but black men don't because a lot of them are former slaves and uh, marriage is basically at the discretion of their owner and they all they can do is hope that enough witnesses who are at the ceremony are around to convince the white pe pension agent that yes indeed this marriage did happen um, and then if there was ever any conflicting evidence you know from the witnesses that these agents test uh, got you know then they would have to launch these special investigations where they would comb up and down the streets finding people trying to determine you know if this marriage actually happened or not um, so it was an extra level of difficulty they had unfortunately in Missouri because of that community that community of from the former Carter plantation everybody knew each other and so what you see in the pension records of soldiers and widows from that community is you see the same people testifying on behalf of their cousin or their aunt or um, you know um, their uh, their uh, you know any other ch their child you know things like this you see the same names over and over again so you have that tight kinship network that worked to propel a lot of these people over that incredible hurdle that black people had um, in getting government support. Um, the, the strength of their community and their testimony together um, helps account for why, um, unlike most, for, for example, so uh, according to one study done by a historian named Donald Schaefer, only about 75% of black men who applied for a pension got one, as opposed to over 90% for white men. But for our group from Albemarle County, 93%, actually more, were successful than this study showed that white op, uh, soldiers were. Our men from Albemarle County, black men, were much more successful 
Um, and I think it's partly due to those, those tight networks that they had, they had formed in this particular instance in Missouri. And then also, unfortunately, um, because <laughs> they had suffered so much, I mean, you could not, not give them a pension, right? Because it, this, the suffering was written on their bodies. Um, and, you know, uh, so if you could prove those things like, yes, these are my children, and yes, this is my uh, legal uh, spouse, or, or I'm the legal widow, um, then, you know, the, just the amount of suffering, the amount of death, you know, uh, I think, unfortunately, accounts for, you know, why they were so successful. Um, I mean, it was great, it's very good that they got those pensions, but it's because of all that suffering and, and the sacrifices they made. Well, I got a couple more questions for Dr. Kurtz, but if you all can think of some, too, I'll open it up in a minute here. But uh, you mentioned the Navy and the Army, so you found... Uh, black Virginians who served in the Navy, were there any stri striking differences between their services? Right, so if you have a, a relative who, so, so the, here's the good news, um, finding men um, from, let's say you, you go home today and you're like, I'm from Charlotte County, I want to do the Charlotte version, County version of what he's talking about. Great news, there's an online database, it's all searchable by birthplace, all in one place for free in the National Park Service. Unfortunately, other than the very basic like data about um, you know uh, their name and birthplace and approximate age and their rank, there's not much else. So for a Civil War soldier, what happens is every single Civil War soldier gets this compiled military service record, and for black men, they're all digitized for uh, on foldfree.com. Sorry, they're not free, but. Um, you know, you could probably get a free membership for a couple weeks for long enough to do what you need to do if you're only looking for a couple people. Um, but for the Navy, they didn't have this at all. It just, it just basically like, he was here at this rendezvous point, he was here at this rendezvous point, and a lot of them, I don't even know when they left, so I'm, I had to guess, like, I, he, let, he must have left the Navy sometime after 1864, the last time he checked in at the rendezvous point. So there's no wonderful res resource of all this information about what they did during the war. But uh, to guess what came to our rescue, for one man, Alexander Kane, uh, he had a pension. And so I was able to look at his pension and fill in all that military data and fill in a little bit of his personal life, not a lot. Um, a lot of the pensions are very thin on pre-war activity. So I know he was a barber in Philadelphia in 1862 when he enlisted as the first man born in Albemarle County to join um, the, the Union um, Army or Navy. Um, but I have no idea how he got there. Was he born free and he moved there? Was he an escaped slave? I don't know. I haven't been able to find anything like that. He had no children. He didn't. He never married, so I have nothing in recollections or memories like that. Um, but he... Uh, left this record behind, and which I was able to then co corroborate with like ship logs from the National Archives. And he served um, in a, uh, on a ship called the St. Louis, and they basically hunted uh, Confederate commerce raiders. Think of like the CSS Alabama. They were going after ships like that, trying to protect Union commerce. Um, I like to think as well, he was off the coast of Spain and um, North Africa. The British and the Americans had signed a treaty saying we will both jointly patrol the Atlantic looking for slave ships because the South is gone. So now the North, now the United States can do that. The South had been holding this up. Um, so I like to think that you know, um, I mean, he they, even though this wasn't their primary duty, if they had found a slave ship, they would have stopped it. I mean, there's no record of it, but it's kind of um, amazing to think like he could have been stopping slavery at the very source. You know, like before um, those people were even brought into slavery. Um, in the South, and there could have been other black men like him serving in those ships. Black men, you couldn't segregate a ship. You could give black men lower wages and lower rankings, which they did all the time, but you couldn't segregate it. So there were black and white, uh, white men serving on the same ship, some with the same lower rankings. Um, again, the top officers are going to be white. But Alexander Kane also served in the blockade off of uh, Charleston and Georgia at the end of the war. And then um, he decided after a year out uh, at the end of the war that he would rejoin the, the Navy and he joined a goodwill tour led by the Civil War hero David Farragut of uh, Mobile, Alabama fame, um, Dan the Torpedoes, Full Speed Ahead. And they went on a goodwill tour of 
every port in the Mediterranean, even uh, the, the Turkish Empire, all the way up um, to Russia, St. Petersburg, and to um, all of the uh, um, Scandinavian countries. So I think Alexander King was probably the best traveled black man from Albemarle County in the 19th century. Um, and just, he returned to Philadelphia, worked uh, the rest of his life as a barber and received a pension. And then at the end of his life, was able to find a short obituary notice saying that the local Republican club was holding a, a, a meeting uh, like in his honor. And he's actually buried in the Philadelphia, um, I, sorry, it's, the name has changed. Um, Philadelphia, I think, Soldier Cemetery, uh, Soldier Sailor Cemetery, a national cemetery, um, which I haven't unfortunately been able to visit yet. But there's actually, I, I'm mentioning, uh, speaking of that, I think there are four or five of soldiers, four or five soldiers from Alvar County who are buried in Arlington um, as well. And I was you know, fortunate enough to go uh, see their, their burial places. So um, then, um, you know, uh, James T.S. Taylor was, I was buried here in Oakwood Cemetery, much more local and a little bit easier yeah, so to get to. Tying it back to the local, like what's what's Taylor? Why is why so much you emphasize him in this article? Um, why is his story particularly important? Because I think Taylor is a symbol of what um, what was possible. Uh, most black men and women didn't have the education that he received. Uh, most of them in Alabama, of course, were enslaved. He was he was uh, brought he was born outside of the out of the county and then moved here before the Civil War. His father worked as a shoemaker. Um, before the war, and he took on that trade as well for a, at least a little while. Um, and he was one of those few men that break. So what was going to ha what was happening um, in Charlottesville was the Confederates were impressing against their will black men, free and enslaved, to build fortifications, to you know like be servants, to um, be um, teamsters, to help the Confederate army. So he didn't want to do that. So he escapes all the way past all the Confederate forces to Washington um, and then is drafted into the second USET and sees service down in Florida. Um, he is, excuse me, he is arrested for a crime he didn't, uh, he was falsely accused of and didn't commit and he actually wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln saying I'm from Washington so who better to, to, to uh, petition to than your, your honor um, to seek my freedom and eventually he was released and um, returned to Charlottesville and um, built himself a home and his wife Eliza who he uh, met and married in, down in Florida in the Key West area. Uh, they lived here pretty much for the rest of their lives. He died in 1918 and received uh, a full page, uh, front page eulogy. Well why for him, why not, uh, well he had been very active in post-war black politics. He had been at the state constitutional convention in 1867 where he um, successfully argued along with other men for the adoption of the paper ballot because um, what was happening was uh, voting was by voice and so former owners were intimidating their former slaves and so the paper ballot was a way to cast your vote secretly without being intimidated by your you know current employer or your former owner uh, which a lot of that was going on he argued for a bunch of a bunch of progressive things that uh, didn't go through as we know, like for example, he was an advocate of interracial um, desegregated schools back in 1867, which um, Virginia wasn't ready for, of course, at that time. And then he um, was vocal in support of Republican candidates for the presidency, including President Grant and President um, Rutherford B. Hayes, who was involved in um, other re local Republican politics in the Charlottesville, Albemarle, uh, Central Virginia area. Um, was successful, had, uh, had a number of ch uh, children who went on to um, achieve things here in Charlottesville as well. And the, the families spread out, and um, as I mentioned earlier, some of them are still here, some of them are as far away as California. Uh, but um, he was really, you know, to me, like, uh, um, he was a man, uh, he showed what was possible. He showed, uh, he accomplished all these great things, and he, he kind of paved the way for other um, black leaders after him to follow in his steps and to achieve even greater things. Sounds like an amazing guy. I think he needs a statue, honestly. <laughs> if we're going to have a statue of oh. a Civil War person. Sorry, I, I didn't want to open that can oh. of worms. <laughs> Tom's like, God, no. Oh, no. Uh, but, oh, no, um, monuments. Uh, well, I mean, we've no. been arguing for six years now that there needs to at least be a plaque of all these men and all their names. 
uh, somewhere in Charlottesville. Um, but if you were going to model um, a statue after anyone, we actually have a photograph of him and his wife from right after the Civil War. So you could actually, you know, have a model for and what who, who better than James T. S. Taylor. The other thing I should mention real quick, Tom, is he also was a correspondent for the leading um, one of the yeah, because Douglas was in New York. Um, the leading African American newspaper in New York City, the Anglo African, and he wrote five letters, which I was able to discover um, with uh, somebody's help, uh, saying, um, you know, describing what was going on during the Civil War. So, like, I actually have in his own words, more so than any other soldier, all of this wonderful detail about what a regiment was like, what the white people thought of them as they marched through occupied Florida, um, from, you know, um, his, uh, his argument, his impassioned, um, logical, and basically unanswerable argument that black men deserve to be officers just like uh, white people, uh, uh, white men, um, it was just a, an amazing resource. Um, he's, he's just an amazing resource, an amazing story to tell. Well, thank you. Um, and I'm not trying to ignore you here. I'm trying to do multitasking and looking at the Facebook. Um, and some comments here I wanted to, one of them I wanted to read here. Uh, Angela Carp Pace says she's watching from Ohio. Hello. Um, third great granddaughter of Miles Carr, USCT 5th Regiment, oh born my. at Free State in Albemarle, killed in Battle of New Market Heights, enlisted in Ohio, lived near Chillicothe. Yeah. Um, thank you for your database and this presentation. So, uh, oh my goodness. The New Market Heights, wasn't that the battle um, where it was like how many Medal of Honors or? Yeah, it was it was a, a number of black regiments were involved, um, including the fifth USUT, which was formed um, in in Ohio, uh, specifically in uh, southern Ohio, uh, and it was um, the African American troops uh, behaved. Uh, they they performed extremely well. Um, there wasn't enough support for them to make a major breakthrough. This was. Um, it's late September or October 1864. I'm sorry, it's a little rusty because it's been a year since I, I've been doing the project. But um, uh, three men from the 5th who were from Albemarle died in that battle. So of the five men who died, um, th three of them were in that battle. It just goes to show you how awful and um, you know uh, uh, bloody that battle was for them. And then they went on to, uh, no, nobody from Albemarle, but a whole bunch of black men, most black men, I think, who received the Medal of Honor in the Army, did so because of that battle. No other battle um, resulted in so many um, African American Medal of Honors. And then Benjamin Butler, who was involved and who was a big advocate from early on in the wars of using black men as laborers and then as soldiers, he was so impressed with his black troops that he actually had special medals struck that I don't know if he gave it to everyone, um, maybe just his regiments but special medals um, commemorating them for taking part in this, in this battle. Um, an historian, a black historian, um, said uh, later in the battle that you know, this once and for all proved the fact that people who said black men couldn't fight were completely wrong, that uh, black men had suffered and had done just as much and were just as good as white soldiers. Again, you don't hear about it because you only hear about glory. Um, and uh, which is a great story, but th this battle like was very pivotal for changing the public's mind and convincing them, uh, especially skeptical whites, that uh, black men would make good soldiers. Well, thank you, Ms. Pace, for sharing that with us. That's that's fabulous information, and, and thank you for your this, the ancestors' service. Um, one other lady here, uh, Cecilia Lightfoot. Thank you so much for sharing this rarely shared, discussed, or taught information. I am an African American prior service U.S. Army soldier. There really has not been enough emphasis placed upon the sacrifices made by African Americans long before they were even considered American or viewed as human beings. Your knowledge and sharing of these facts are so greatly appreciated. So, great, uh, great discussion here. And I got some of my, uh, like Sam Taller and Lorenzo um, is on. Uh, Facebook comment. They're all back and forth here. It's pretty crazy sometimes when they get there. So anyway, I'm going to get the Facebook thing away from me and open it up to you all. Do you all have any questions? Sure. Um, did any of the uh, soldiers from um, Oklahoma County serve in um, like a reunion after 
when the North and South Pawnee got together, like see the photos from Gettysburg, yeah. they allow blacks to be in, participate in those? Uh, for the most part, it was those were white only affairs. Uh, I, there were, um, so I'll, I'll pivot from that to slightly give you a tangent at the end of this. But um, I haven't found any evidence of them being involved in any reunions, um, except for specifically Union Army reunions. So like the veterans after the war from both sides joining hands, I didn't see any of that. Uh, African Americans were generally more skeptical of that because in order to um, and rightfully so. In order to make that that um, you know bridge that gap, um, it came at the expense of, of black rights in many cases. There's a wonderful book called Race and Reunion by David Blight, um, and basically a lot of the people who were pushing those reunions, not all, but um, some of them um, were doing so uh, for partisan reasons, or were doing so at like they knew that they couldn't talk about civil rights for African Americans, so they at those because they would be too contentious, so they just like pushed it to the side um, and, and abandoned them in some cases. Um, with that being said, uh, five, now six, because Joseph Carr, uh, one of our most recent uh, finds uh, last year, was also a member of the Grand Army of the Republic. For a long time, people thought that the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the leading veterans organization for the Union Army after the Civil War, was strictly segregated. But then somebody came along and realized that, especially in places where there weren't a lot of black men, like in Michigan or Northern Ohio, places like that, that white men actually welcomed black men into integrated union um, veterans groups, into those GARs. So a lot of our men actually were joined uh, hands across the racial divide, but within the union soldiery, right? Not with Confederates. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question, too, and maybe you can't answer this. Um, was there a, 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 a black medical corps? What, what happened to a black soldier when he was wounded? Was he, was he treated the same way with the, with the whites, or did they have a separate medical corps for the black soldiers? Uh, they only had one medical corps, um, you know, de, de facto, based upon where they might be uh, stationed. There would be a, re a regimental hospital, which would, I mean, if it's regimental, then it's going to be segregated because it's just for the black regiment. But, you know, if it's a lot of, like in Louisiana, for example, and it's all black regiments there, they're going to be at that segregated hospital. That's a really good question, though. I can't answer it in every case. Um, my guess is that it was, you know, where they could, it was, and where it wasn't possible, they put them together. Um, I definitely seen uh, cases of. Uh, I, I, I do know that not all hospitals were segregated; that there were cases of black men being um, treated. There were a number of uh, black men who would have served as um, like nurses, as untrained nurses. Um, maybe because they were recuperating from wounds or disease or something like that. Um, but there weren't many black doctors at all, so it was mostly a white medical corps. Thank you. Um, yes? Uh, how many of the uh, black soldiers were actually free? Okay, that's a good question. So when I wrote the article, I think I, exa I, think, um, I think I said about 50, and now I went back and was a little bit more strict with my definition. Mm -hmm. And I think definitively I can say that 42 of them. So of the 257, the, the new number, 131 were definitely enslaved at the start of the Civil War. 42 were free, um, largely based upon where they're enlisting and because I know that they were living there before the war started. And then for 84 men, I have no idea. Was um, Taylor free? He was. Oh. He was. Taylor was definitely free. Um, <laughs> Dabney O'Butler, who uh, I could mention later, who was the 257th man, um, was free. He was living in Chillicote, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there were probably more free men, um, and there were pro and but I'm guessing of that unknown, most of them are were probably slaves at the start of the war. And the reason they weren't really good at recording that, but the reason why they did sometimes record that is because if you were free before April 19th, 1861, effectively the start of the Civil War, you got more money if you enlisted. And if you weren't, then you got less money. So in Alexander Kane's case, for example, most 
escaped black men who served in like a Mississippi, and most of our men, the other five um, sailors that I didn't mention, they're serving in Mississippi gunboats, you know, up and down the Mississippi, jostling for control there and, and, and not out on the ocean or anything like that. Um, those, those men who run away and you know, join the ship, they're enlisted as boys. Um, like pretty much every former slave is, is given the ranking of boy, which is the absolute lowest. But because Cain is free, he gets to be a landsman, which is only one better, but still it, it translates to better pay, you know, um, and, and, and all of that, and a little bit more you know, seniority. So um, it's, yeah, it, it was frustrating, and I wasn't able to figure that out, that out for some of them. Um, for, for men who didn't, especially if they didn't file a pension record, like, I don't know anything about them. Like, they show up, like, there's a man, for example, named John Adams, and he shows up, uh, enlists outside of Albemarle in, like, the Norfolk area, and then leaves the army, and then his name is John Adams. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he moved. He didn't move back to Albemarle. I looked for that. But he, I don't know which one... I, did he stay in Norfolk? Did he move to the north? I, I have no idea what happened to him. So there's a lot of these stories where maybe, you know, like as we put it out, somebody on Facebook said, I'm um, descended from a uh, car. Maybe somebody's like, oh, yeah, I know John Adams. And I'm hoping that people will chime in and say, um, hey, we know all this information about this, this person. So um, and in a number of cases, that's how we found people. Uh, Joseph Carr and Dabney Butler were the result of a uh, very um, – generous woman named Alice Cannon, who's part of the Central Virginia History Research Group, um, who Sam Taller, Sam Taller is also a member of that, who's also very generous. But um, thank you, Alice. The last two people I found, you found. Um, so um, she gave us, she shared all of her research. People were very generous. We were generous back. Um, it was, you know, I'm just hoping that some people will chime in and say, hey, I can fill out more of that story. Or um, hey, he changed his name. He does have a pension, but he changed his name. That's why you couldn't find him. Um, you know, uh, in one case, I, I was looking for a man forever and ever, and couldn't figure out what happened to him because I figured he would never have left the North after the war. But he actually moved down to Louisiana, and so I found him in Louisiana. And the only reason I could find him was because, and his name was horribly misspelled in the census. So there's no way, right? The only re re way I found out about him was because I finally got his pension record, and he says, "Oh yeah, I went to Louisiana." And here are my kids' names, and I'm like, son of, you know, there he is. <laughs> so he's all the way in Louisiana um, as a farmer, you know, and um, it's uh, not what you would expect because uh, a lot of the men move the opposite way. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, two questions. One, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. You heard a lot. Um, maybe you mentioned this earlier, but uh, the first question is the 127 regiment, which was not part of what division, which corps, which army? Uh, it was the 127th was part of the oh gosh sorry I it's been a little while since I've looked at that regiment but they were part of um, a I think it was the I want to say it was the Army of the James there was a sort of separate army that was kind of attached to the Army of the Potomac but wasn't of the Army of the Potomac so there are actually no black men black soldiers who fight in the Army of the Potomac because the black men fighting alongside of them are part of this other army that's associated with Butler. So they're part of that unit, um, and which kind of explains, um, and a lot of them end up in the Appomattox campaign. Uh, a couple other regiments, I think six total, are all part of that separate army that is with the Army of the Potomac, under Grant, but not, not part of the Army of the Potomac. Okay. The other question I have is, uh, during Reconstruction, uh, I'm trying to envision these black soldiers that um, come back to the South and live, especially out the road, let's say. Uh, there's a lot of discrimination on them. I wonder how they were treated, especially with former slaves. What type of employment did they have? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what we found were almost all of the men um, who had been uh, slaves at the start of the Civil War there and were able to trace after the war. So I'm, this is the caveat, right? There's about half of them. I'm not quite sure what happened to them after the Civil War. But of those the half of the 257 we were able to trace, almost all of them are um, unskilled laborers. So they're sharecroppers, they're farmers, which could be a sharecropper, um, they're, um, they're field hands, they're doing a lot of the same stuff they were doing before. So there's no real chance for um, upward economic mobility for them at all. Ta that's why Taylor's 
really an exception. He's an amazing story, but he's very much the exception. Um, he had that skilled trade. Um, some other men in the North had skilled trades of their carpenters, but um, they are they are basically um, regulated to those those lower trades that low, that lower economic status. A lot of them are illiterate, of course, after the war too. So that's holding them back as well, or they didn't have much of an education. Um, maybe their children would get actually have more of an education uh, than they would. But um, as far as you know, discrimination goes, uh, you know. Um, Taylor ran for um, a seat in the um, House of Delegates, the Virginia House of Delegates, twice and was turned down. And a lot of that had to do with um, anti-white um, sentiment against him. So they kind of mobilized against him. We don't want another black man in the Virginia State Congress. So he definitely felt it. Um, and then other men, you see it in their pension records. So you see it when um, they're uh, uh, being interviewed and or their friends are being interviewed and you see things like somebody says something like well all the witnesses are are, are uh, you know as they would say uh, are they negroes they're black men so we can only their their testimonies is not as good as a white person's so you actually have some pension agents um who should be helping these men who sacrifice on behalf of the union um especially in the south if these people are in the south you have some of them you know definitely applying racist standards to understand these people and to um, to judge whether or not they're telling the truth and, and having a negative effect on their ability to get government aid as a result. I can imagine there was a lot of real hatred and discrimination, especially if they served the Union Army. Uh, yeah. For example, like you mentioned earlier, if they were captured, they would unlikely be shot or sent back to a prior slave owner. Uh, that they attitude towards them must have been very, very powerful. Yes, and I mean, the fact that a lot of them would have been part of the local Republican organizations, you know, so actively right. political, um, not only were they involved in the Southern defeat as soldiers, but they're also then trying to pass laws um, that white Southerners don't want, you know, that, that makes them, that puts a big bullseye on their, their backs. I haven't seen any evidence of like, of lynchings in this group, but we definitely know that this happened, that a lot of the leaders were soldiers as a result of their service, and therefore they were the targets of, um, of lynchings uh, after the Civil War by the KKK and other groups. Yes, ma'am. I think words have to make more Okay. I grew up in Missouri, and I grew up in the South, and it's called Shell Coffee. Coffee was same way that they call money shallow there instead of money shallow, so it means chill on top. It's interesting that they're not that far away. Yeah. Question. You said a few of them were buried in Arlington? Yes. How did they qualify and what did they have to do to be listed? Uh, so they, I mean, they should qualify. Yeah, they, they qualified as a result of, of, um, of being soldiers who um, served in the Union Army. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't have a black soldier who dies in Missouri being shipped, uh, being buried in Arlington. But if you're, uh, if you're local, if you're in the area, um, you, would be, you would be buried there. So Churchwell, for example, is, was moved to D.C. after the war and is buried in, in Arlington. Um, there's another uh, couple of men whose names I don't remember off the top of my head. But um, there actually is, uh, as you'd imagine, a segregated plot. So a couple of our men are buried in that segregated plot uh, for Union soldiers who died after the war. Um, another man is buried in uh, a section that was like for refugees who died during the Civil War. Um, he was a, a soldier who lived after the war um, uh, and was buried in that segregated section as well. But um, yeah, they so they qualified based upon um, their service. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so it's um, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's and it's all as you'd imagine. It's the very bare bones monuments. It's not like the big ones you see for the, the generals. Um, you know, they're, they're basically all privates, so um, uh, it's the very basic, like, last name kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's it. 
Yeah, so it's, and uh, he died in 1902, so um, he, he's sort of like in the middle of that, of that, that section of the cemetery, church walls, excuse me. Okay, one more question here. Go ahead, Jane. Going back to James Taylor, uh, any idea when his ancestors received uh, manumission? And also, is it yeah. true that Fairfax Taylor, his dad, opposed his uh, nomination or election to the uh, convention? Okay, I, that's a really good question. I actually don't know the details of their manumission. Um, I, didn't, I didn't look into Fairfax's story that much, but I'm sure it's out there. Uh, and as far as his father opposing him, yes, he did. He wasn't radical enough. His father thought he wasn't radical enough on the issues and actually supported, a, I believe, a white man because he thought the white man was going to be more reliable on the issues. But I mean, when you look at what Taylor did, he, he's, he wants to desegregate the schools and he wants to completely reform um, the, uh, the voting system in Virginia. So um, I, I don't know what the other guy must have been for, but um, Taylor was definitely pushing for black rights, you know, um, too radical, unfortunately, at the time to pass some of his agenda. <laughs> okay. Um, father, son, squabble there. <laughs> uh, just, just a little one. <laughs> yeah, just a little. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank our folks out on Facebook. Um, before we go, uh, don't forget, um, Center at Belvedere, thank you very much for having us. We also have the Francis Band exhibits here on uh, display through the end of August, so come on down and take a look at them. Uh, stay tuned for Facebook and emails and other social media and other things that will tell you about our next programs. Remember, everything we do as your historical society is because of your support. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to help us, please visit our website. You can donate on there. Unregulated Historical Meandering brought to you by the Charlottesville, Altmar Charlottesville Historical Society, wonderful supporters like you. Thank you, Dr. Kurtz, for joining us today. You, it's been great. Um, thank you everyone who came out to the Center at Belvedere. Thank you everyone out there on Facebook. I want to send a particular thank you out there for Lorenzo Dickerson who provided this audio video contraption that seems to have worked <laughs> fabulously, even though I'm wandering around here doing all this. I'm Tom with Will. I uh, hope to see you for our next meeting. So thank you very much. <laughs>